Hello and welcome to the program, The Advocate. The Advocate is a program designed to deliberate on issues of anti-corruption and accountability in governance. My name is Jack Vincent Fidelis, and I am your anchorman. With me in the studio to discuss this program is a senior lecturer with the University of Maiduguri, Dr. Musa Usman. Sir, you are welcome. It's my pleasure. In the studio, we have with us members of the audience. They will be making their contributions in the course of the program. Sir, how can transparency, anti-corruption, and accountability be entrenched in the polity? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vincent. Um, this, this is a very loaded question. We are talking about three things. Transparency, accountability, and uh, anti-corruption. Anti mm. There are three significant aspects of governance, uh, but the most interesting thing is that all three of them are connected. You cannot talk about anti-corruption without entrenching transparency in governance. In fact, transparency in governance is what leads to uh, the elimination of corruption. And perhaps over the years, what has been missing in governance in Nigeria is lack of transparency in government business. So uh, first and foremost, to entrench these three aspects or three things that you mentioned, there are a lot of things to be done. So the things that I cannot actually uh, mention all of them here now, but there are three fundamental platforms that we have to take note of. First, we have to have a government that is willing to ensure that there is transparency, that corruption is actually fought to a stop. We have to have a government that is willing to do that. Now, secondly, we, we need to have institutions. Uh, we need to have a very, very strong institutions that are going to work and implement the anti-corruption policies of government. Those institutions should not only exist on pieces of paper, but they should, they should be seen to be acting and carrying out their, their statutory functions of ensuring transparency and eliminating corruption. And thirdly, I think perhaps the most fundamental are the people in the society themselves, because it's one thing for you to enact laws it's another thing for you to establish institutions, but then you need to have a population that is willing to actually uh, abide by the laws and follow the instructions of such institutions. We need to have a society, a populace, that is ready to accept uh, the anti-corruption crusade and ensure that whatever conduct, whatever practice they do, whether in public or private, they ensure that there is some sense of... Uh, transparency in what they're doing. So these three things are very fundamental. The government, the institutions, and then the people in the society. Uh, once we have a synergy between these three platforms, then I think we have started the process of entrenching uh, these three aspects that you mentioned in, in, in governance. And I think it's the first step that we need to take. In fact, it is, uh, these three things are what makes us different from the developed societies of the world, where they have, in a way, eliminated corruption. Uh, go to countries like, I don't want to mention United States, but go to Scandinavian countries like, uh, like Denmark, uh, like Norway, where you have uh, uh, public institutions and governance working at 99.9%. What they do is there is a very high sense of transparency and accountability in governance, and as a result, corruption is naturally eliminated. And that is, the, that is what is supposed to be the focus of, of governance in Nigeria. Once we tackle those two things, then we are heading towards uh, eliminating corruption in Nigeria. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, you see, Nigeria, we all know, is one country that is endowed with more than enough human and natural resources. Yeah. We shouldn't be crying now over 50, over 50 years after independence. Mm. What is actually going wrong? I know in the course of answering your, the first question, you, you've touched some of these things, but then what exactly is that thing that is preventing Nigeria mm. from attaining the desired goal as a country? What is that thing? In terms of achieving developmental goals? In terms of achieving de developmental goals, mm. in terms of living that, what, what, what we, we, people we choose to call the third world country syndrome. Mm. You know, going beyond that, we have all it takes mm. to be like these Scandinavian countries, as you just mentioned. Yeah, we have, we, have, we have all it takes. In fact, we have more than what it takes. Then what's the if, problem? If, if you look at the, the, those countries I mentioned, mm. their, their population is a fraction of our population. 
They don't have a fraction of the natural resources that we have. And what, in any economy in the world, population matters. The more population you have, the bigger the economy. So uh, the, the, we have more than it takes. But like I, like I said, over the years, you said 50 years, over 50 years. Over 50 years. Of over 50 years of independence, there, are, there is something system, systemically, uh, systematically wrong with the Nigerian project. And there are a lot of factors you mentioned. Factors of governance, or I'm sorry, factors of leadership. Over the years, we have not been blessed with leaders that are willing to take the country to the next level. Uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with whether it is the military or the civilians. It cuts across all the, the, the leader, leadership that we have. We didn't have leaders, and at all levels, whether at, this, at the federal, at the state, or local government level, we do not have leaders that, that actually have the country at heart. Uh, we have leaders who come, who make uh, promises, who make statements, policy statements, but these statements just go without any form of implementation. Hmm. So if... Nigeria had leaders mm. like Julius Nyerere, mm. or you had leaders like, uh, like, like Nelson Mandela, or you have charismatic leaders like uh, Fidel Castro, for instance. We would have been in uh, another level, but most leaders are not proactive, and it's a very big challenge. Secondly, our, we, the ordinary people, we also have our own problems. Uh, a typical Nigerian is not patriotic. Let's speak the truth. A typical Nigerian is not uh, patriotic. For you to see the, 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 the definition of patriotism, you don't have to go far. Go to Chad, go to Niger, and see how the ordinary people on the streets, the sugar cane seller, the, the cobbler, how they exhibit the sense of patriotism, the love for their country. You discover that we don't love our country. And because we don't do that, we, we as ordinary people, not the government now, we engage in various activities that actually affect the development process. That is one uh, another significant aspect. Maybe a third issue is over the la last 50 years is the fact that successive governments have failed to implement policies that will take the country to the next level. I didn't say there are other policies. There, there, in fact, from 1960 to date, if you are going to take uh, a compendium of the policies implemented by successive governments, you are going to have maybe 50 or 100 volumes. But then you discover that most of these policies are misplaced priorities. Uh, some of the policies are based on nepotism. Some of the policies are, not are good, but not fully implemented or religiously implemented. Some of them are just on, on pieces of paper, and there is no any sense of implementation. For instance, during the 70s, up to the 80s, there was these development plans, the first development plan, the second development, which was, which was a very beautiful policy document that was designed by the military government then. Yeah. And if those development plans were fully implemented, maybe we would have been at a different level now. But the, the problems cut across from the government to the people uh, in the society. And when I talk about the government, uh, I'm not talking about the central government alone, but even the state government and the local government, because the issues of development cut across all the levels of government. Hmm. And unless we see such changes, it will be very, very difficult for us to say we have, we have reached a level uh, the level at which these Scandinavian countries are. Hmm. Remember, I tell you, their population is just a fraction of our population. But what makes them go in? Their society, they, they are patriotic, their government is very transparent, and the government implements policies that are meant to improve the lives of the people. And as a result, you see there is a lot of progress in the society. All right. Viewer, in case you are just joining us, you are onto the program The Advocate, a program where we tackle issues of anti corruption and accountability. I am still with my guest, uh, Dr. Musa Usman. And then, right now, we'll be, uh, I, wa I want you, sir, mm. to see the role of the electorate. Mm. We've spoken quite extensively on the leadership. Mm. The electorate, how what is that thing the electorate can do to bring about credible leaders? Because it seems the leadership is a reflection of the people. Yeah. So what can the electorate do? How can they play their own quota? Well, it's good we are talking about the electorate at this uh, material time. Good. Because it's a very auspicious moment for us to talk about the electorate. Because yeah. in a real democracy, the electorates are the ones that will determine who leads the society. 
that is in the real democracy, where voting counts. What happens to our, our experimentation of democracies from 1960 to date is the fact that in most instances, people's votes don't count. And when the votes of the electorates don't count, then there is virtually nothing the electorates can do. But since the dawn of the new dispensation from 1999 to date, hmm. at least our democracy is maturing. To some extent, people's votes are counting. And if people's votes are now counting, then we, the electorates, we have an opportunity to ensure that we change the situation. Uh, the, the, the most uh, ordinary thing that we hear people talk about is they, you have to say, don't collect money, don't collect homo, don't collect sugar and salt and all this. Of course, yes, don't collect those things. But then we have to sit down as the electorates and understand those who are contesting for political offices. First of all, we have to ensure that we eliminate all kinds of um, myopic thoughts, all kinds of um, ideas that will make us to make the wrong choice. First of all, understand those people who are contesting for political offices, understand their programs, and have, a, have an opportunity to engage such persons. And that is one thing that is wrong with our democracy in Nigeria. In our, in our own democracy, the electorates do not have the adequate opportunity to engage the contestants for political offices. And that's, in the United States, it's not, it's, it's not like that. A, 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 a contestant for the, for the position of Senate will go to the community, will go to the constituency, to the, to the town hall, to the market square, to the, to the mall, where he will meet the ordinary people one-on-one -on -one and he will talk to them. And he will now be, be pitching. He will be pitching his ideas to them. They will ask him questions and he will respond to these questions. It doesn't happen in, this, in our society here. That is one thing we have to correct. The openness of the contestants and the opportunity for the electorates to actually meet the contestants, understand their programs. Unfortunately, we the electorates in Nigeria today, we still have that problem. People don't vote according to that. People vote according to certain considerations, whether social, uh, ethnic, religious, or, or even relational. These are factors that determine how people vote. The electorates must, must, we, the electorates, must change that perspective to understand, for us to be able to understand the quality of the candidates that are, that are going for political offices. Engage them, understand their programs, and then vote according to our conscience. The, the dictum, one man, one vote, yeah. is a very significant uh, uh, concept in this our discussion here. So, as, as the electorates, uh, we have a role to play. And like I said some moments ago, it's a nice thing that from 1999 to date, um, unlike what happened in the First Republic and the Second Republic, it seems our votes are counting. So this is an opportunity for us, since our votes are now gradually counting, for us to ensure positive change uh, in governance in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It's at this juncture that I want to go over to members of the audience to see if they have a question to ask our guests from all we've been discussing so far. Good. You will uh, introduce yourself and then uh, ask your question. My name is Amina Abakar. I want to know who is the ideal leader. Okay. Uh, who is the ideal leader? Yeah. Um, something that we crave for in Nigeria today. That is it. Uh, the ideal leader. There are examples of ideal leaders around the world uh, that we mentioned. Though I, I wouldn't say they are perfect. But even before, I don't want to even mention names, but an ideal leader is a leader that has vision and focus. A leader that has vision and focus. Somebody who comes off and says, I want to contest for political office, and you ask him, uh, what is your program? And he starts reeling out the normal, mundane, everyday things we hear. I will build bridges, I will build roads. Of course, these are, these are things that we hear from, from politicians in decades. Of course, a leader is supposed to be, an ideal leader is supposed to be, have vision. He is supposed to have focus. Vision for what he feels his people should be or where his people should be. That is number one. Number two, an ideal leader is a leader that has empathy for member, uh, members of the society. He has to empathize with them, feel their pains. Unfortunately, this one is not, for now, this one is not in the dictionary of, Niger of, of, of a typical Nigerian politician. Empathizing with the community is not. If not, why would you elect a representative to the National Assembly? 
this year, and then he disappears and he doesn't resurface until after four years. He doesn't empathize with the, with, with, the, with, with the community. So the leader must empathize with the members of the community. The leader must have vision, and then the leader must have focus. And an ideal leader should have a laid out program. A laid out program, not this mundane thing, but specific targets. That is how real politicians are in the developed societies. They have specific targets for the period, for the four years. This is what I want to achieve. And as the years, are, as the months are going by, an ideal leader will now be, will be checking. There will be a checklist to ensure whether he has attained these specific targets. Unfortunately, this is, these things are lacking in our society. And of course, the last aspect is an ideal leader is a leader who sees members of, the, of his own society as his own family. We have them. I mentioned some of them, like people like Gilles Nyerere, people like uh, Nelson Mandela, like uh, Fidel Castro, I've mentioned. Even uh, if you read the story of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, India, if, 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 if you sit down and read uh, the story of Mahatma Gandhi from the time he was in South Africa up to the time he moved back to India and started the anti-colonialist struggle, you see the exhibition of empathy, sympathy, and vision for his people. And as in the process, he, he, was, yeah, he even constrained himself. He, he, was engaged, he suffered himself. He, he got a lot of injuries. He went into um, fasting, you know, forced fasting and all these things just because he wants his people to what? To, 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 to enjoy the, the, the benefits uh, that are existing in the society. So these are some of the qualities we need in our leaders. And at all levels now, I'm not talking about the president of Nigeria, but whether it is the councillor, the local government chairman, the, the governor, the, 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 the ministers, the vice president, the president, all of them must have these qualities. Then we can call them ideal leaders. And it's something that is, for now, in real, real short supply in Nigeria, I must say, unfortunately. I, I must really thank you, uh, our Dr. Musa, for these wonderful uh, ideas that have been coming out of you. You've actually enlightened the whole of us. And to our viewer, the program is The Advocate. It's good to know you are still with us. Now, having said everything we've said so far, this fight against corruption is one thing we've been hearing about since October 1, 1960, when Nigeria gained political independence. Is it a hopeless situation? It is not a, it is, it is not a hopeless situation. Uh, I, personally, speaking for myself, yeah. I have hope. That things will be good? That, that the, uh, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the fight against corruption is going to reach a stage where we will say we are making progress. Okay. Um, Despite the challenges, despite the problems that, that, that are bedeviling the present government, the present administration, at least we have seen some elements of the will, the desire to fight corruption in this government. Even though I'm not saying corruption is not happening in, in this government. I'm not in government, but we hear what people say. So and I, I will not mention things that I don't have any uh, evidence to back them up. But I wouldn't say corruption is not taking place in the present government. But at least we have seen the will, the desire, the determination to fight corruption. And I believe after this government leaves, another government, another set of leaders come, national leaders come, they will, they will definitely take a cue from this present administration and perhaps improve on what has been done. So I, I, I think it's not a hopeless case. Uh, Nigerians are more enlightened now. Nigerians, if, if you compare Nigerians of today mm. and Nigerians of 20 years back, Nigerians are more enlightened, and they are becoming more and more enlightened. And as a result, it is not a hopeless case because as the years go by, uh, Nigerians will become more enlightened and to understand their rights, their privileges, and their roles in the society, and it will improve on the fight against corruption. All right. Yeah. And then you see, in other parts of the world, like China, talking about Southeast Asia, mm. they don't take this issue of corruption lightly. We read cases of past leaders incarcerated yes. on corruption charges. Yes. That doesn't happen in this part of the world. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Vincent, that is one problem with the anti-corruption fight in Nigeria. The punishment is not, is not commensurate with the crime. That is it. So the punishment is not commensurate with the crime. As a result of that, people do whatever they want. There's this thing that lawyers arrange uh, uh, they call it plea bargaining. Yeah. You know, 
still 100 naira. Hmm. Go, go to court, return 60 or 65 naira, and then keep, keep the rest. rest. So it, 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 it's, it's so interesting, you know. Hmm. People are no longer afraid to steal because the punishment is uh, the punishment is, is not commensurate with the crime. In, in China, you mentioned China, yeah. and I know why you mentioned China because in yes. China is you can be executed that is it. for corruption. There is one recent case in which the police commissioner of a city, a very big city in China, like mm. New York, a very big city, the police commissioner was on the traffic, something happened on the, on the, on the traffic, and he, he came out personally to control the traffic with his men. And as they were watching the CCTV footage, uh, when the footage was posted on television, uh, uh, the anti-corruption people in China now observed that the wristwatch on the, on the wrist of the commissioner's hand is a Rolex. And they now put two and two together and said, his salary cannot, as a, as a policeman, his salary cannot get that resource. Why did he get there? And as a result of that resource, he was arrested, he was dismissed, and then he was jailed. Because obviously, uh, he's, he's, he, he bought that expensive gold resource with proceeds of corruption. So, but it's ordinary resource. People do bigger things in this country and they go scot free. And that is why this thing is, is festering. Because unless government enhances the law. We, we have the institutions. We have the ICPC, we have the EFCC, we have the ICPC, the EFCC, we have several institutions, including NATI, you know, the Nigerian Extractive Industry Initiative, mm -hmm. you know, and so many of them. We have a lot of governmental and non-governmental institutions that are focused on anti-corruption. Government needs to now um, enhance the capacity of these governmental institutions, make them bite harder, enact more laws to make them stronger and more stringent and more independent so that they will never be politicized, which is one problem we are facing. So if that is done, at least we are, we will be making some progress. And people also need to change their own perspective and the way they look at this issue of corruption. So it's, it's a big problem. Uh, every government that comes over the years will say, we will fight corruption, we will fight corruption. Yes, but then this problem still fester because the institutions are not strong, the policies are not virulent, and Punishment is not commensurate with the crime, and these are things that we should change. And I, I think the, the civil society should take this matter up. People have been doing it, like Sislak. Yeah. The civil, uh, the, the, that's one. Uh, Sislak. Uh, Sislak, yes. Rafsanjani. Rafsanjani, yes. They are pursuing this issue very well, and we hope that uh, very soon we'll get some kind of constitutional amendment uh, enhancing the roles of the ICPC, the EFCC, so that they can bite harder. All right. Yeah, having said this, uh, for, uh, because of time, mm. maybe in, in, in 30 seconds, mm. if we don't do what the Chinese are doing, do you see us succeeding? Well, you are trying to, I don't want to shoot myself on the foot. Um, if we don't do what the Chinese are doing, I'm not saying we should do exactly what the Chinese are doing, but we should do something similar to that. Uh, let me be very careful with my statements, you know. Um, the punishment should be very stringent. This idea of plea bargaining should go. The punishment should be st stringent. And Nigerians, uh, mind you, Vincent, Nigerians will have confidence in this fight against corruption, when, like you said, when they see high-profile individuals in jail. That is it. So once you don't have these high-profile individuals in jail, it is a problem. The recent what cases that the federal government is celebrating, the, uh, what is his name? Joshua Darie and uh, uh, Joel Nyame. Nyame. These are uh, extraneous cases. Joel, mm -hmm. Joel Nyame was governor years back. Yeah. And then Joshua Darie is somebody who has, uh, to me, who has stepped on so many toes, so mm. it's expendable. Right. But there are some people who have this aura that they are not expendable. Those are the people that we need to see behind bars. Then Nigerians will have confidence in the fight against corruption. Thank you very much, sir. Well, viewer, that is the much we can take on the program, The Advocates. I personally enjoyed myself, and I must say a very big thank you to our guest, Dr. Musa Usman. Sir, you. you are most welcome to The Advocate. Thank you. We hope subsequently, if we invite you, we'll have you again. Thank you. And to our wonderful members of the audience, I thank you very much for your presence here, and then we look forward to seeing you in our subsequent edition. That is how it has been on The Advocate. If you've had a wonderful time, then keep a date with us. Same time. <music>